Welcome everybody to the session on entrepreneurship. My name is Amy Ko and my co-speaker will be Radhika Nagpal. So my name is Amy and I'm a professor at the University of Washington in the Information School. I study human computer interaction, computer science education and software engineering, especially developer tools, learning technologies and theories of learning and teaching computer science. In 2012, I co-founded AnswerDash and raised millions in venture capital I was the chief technology officer for about three years, and then I returned to the University of Washington in 2015. I'll talk about that later in my section of the talk. Here are some fun facts about me. I have a 19-year-old daughter in college at the University of California at San Diego. My favorite thing to do is travel the world and have food adventures with my wife. That's not something I've been able to do for the last year, unfortunately. And I'm transgender, which is exhausting and wonderful at the same time. Here's how we'll spend the next 30 minutes. I will speak for about 10 minutes about entrepreneurship. Then I'll speak for another 10 minutes about my experience founding and funding a company full time. And then Radhika will spend 10 minutes talking about patents, licensing, part-time contributions, and inspirational founders. Both then answer questions for about 25 minutes live. So entrepreneurship in computer science really is a broad activity. It's anything that involves taking some financial risk, to start an organization that leverages computing innovations. And that covers a lot of different things. The key difference between entrepreneurship and any other activity is that it's starting an organization or joining a new organization rather than joining an established one. That's really the central difference. And so this can look like many different things, not just startup companies. It might mean starting a consulting business based on your expertise and getting paid hourly for your time. It might mean giving away an innovation and asking for personal donations to cover bandwidth and maintenance. That's not really starting a business, but it's still starting something entrepreneurial. It might mean starting a not-for-profit supported by philanthropic money. It might mean starting a for-profit business supporting, supported by a revenue stream. It's possible you might raise small amounts from angel investors, people who are individuals giving money to start a company, and they might buy a small amount of time to reach profitability using their resources. And then finally, you might raise larger amounts of venture capital to buy a larger amount of time to reach profitability. Sometimes venture capital is used to buy a three to five year runway to earn time to build a profitable business. So why do entrepreneurship? There's lots of reasons that people have for doing this. There's no one reason that satisfies every single individual. It can help your ideas have impact on the world. You can learn about business, including products, marketing, and sales. There's also a joy in tackling challenging projects in a team of smart, motivated people. And if you start a business, it can give you control over the culture and values of your organization. And that can sometimes be more empowering than going to an organization that already has an established one. There's also some small possibility of making money. Most startups and organizations don't make a lot of money, if any, but sometimes that happens and sometimes people get wealthy from it. And then finally, you'll learn more at a startup likely than going into a narrow role at an established larger business because you'll take on more responsibilities because there won't be as many people to divide up all of those responsibilities into. Why avoid entrepreneurship? There are a lot of downsides. It can require a personal financial sacrifice sometimes, such as self-funding a company or living without health insurance, for example, in the United States. It can be very stressful because business moves fast and requires a lot of decisions with limited information. And that's a different kind of stress than happens in, in academia doing research. The world of business is also still full of sexist, racist, and sometimes classist gatekeeping, which can make it very challenging to break through. And entrepreneurship of all kinds can take a lot of time, which requires not just personal sacrifice, but the sacrifice of partners, friends, family, and children as well. So it's something that sometimes you have to decide with other people. Timing with startups can be everything. Is it the right time in your life to take on the adventure and the risk and the stress to learn, strive, and intensely collaborate on a team? Sometimes the timing is not right, and it's actually a better thing to do in, later in the future. Is it the right time for your innovation in a marketplace when there's some opportunity for success? Sometimes ideas are too early and the world isn't ready for them. Sometimes they're too late and you've missed your window to really have some impact on some marketplace. Timing like both of these can be really difficult to judge. I mean, it can be hard to get advice about entrepreneurship without talking to other entrepreneurs. So even deciding to start something requires a lot of learning from a lot of other experts. One surprising thing that a lot of people in computer science find when they start thinking about entrepreneurship is that technology is often a minor consideration in business. In most businesses, what's innovative about computer science 
isn't as important as whether that innovation has a couple of key qualities. For example, is the innovation significantly more valuable to customers than their current solutions? If it's only incrementally more valuable, that's probably not enough to get them to change what they're currently doing. Is the innovation hard to copy? Because if it's a secret, you can usually build a business off of that. But if it requires expertise to replicate, that can be another protective factor. But if it's really easy to implement and it's been published, sometimes that's actually a disadvantage in business because it means some other organization might take that idea and then prevent you from competing with them. And finally, technologies that are so innovative, something that's so disruptive, sometimes customers can see that as risky and not actually want to invest in something that they don't know the properties of, they don't know the outcomes of. These are all in tension with the values in academia, right? Where we want something that's open, that others can recreate and replicate. We want things that are novel. And in the marketplace, sometimes those things are not actually as valued. Novelty is a risk. Openness is a risk. And so taking that shift in mindset is actually a really important thing to do. While technology might be minor, business can be major. The harder problems in any entrepreneurial organization are how do you get customers' attention? How do you convince them to buy or subscribe or adopt? How do you make your product more valuable than competitors? And that's not always obvious and not always something that's a technical problem, but sometimes a design problem or a marketing problem. And how do you spend less than you make to make sure that your company can actually be profitable? Figuring out the business model for a business is often a harder problem. And none of these are really computer science problems. They're all sales problems, marketing problems, and finance problems. Now I want to turn our attention to my own story doing some entrepreneurship. I have noted a couple of publications here. I ended wrapping this up in around 2017 and published a couple of papers about some of the experiences that I had doing it, just because it revealed to me as a software engineering researcher, a lot of things that are challenging about building software and industry and also about technology transfer. So the story started off here. I was an assistant professor. I was only about three years into my tenure track and I was very lucky. I had just started advising a wonderful doctoral student, Parmeet Chalana. We were brainstorming about software help and how hard it is to find help online unless you're a very savvy searcher. And she was really interested in solving this problem of helping people find software help online in ways that Google was failing them. And I was interested in that too. And so we came up with this idea of selection-based search rather than typing in some textual query of what you needed help on. The idea was that customers and users would point to some part of the user interface, whether it was a text label or a button or some part of some graphical user interface, and use that as a proxy for what they needed help about. And what we found in some of our research was that it was actually a really powerful proxy. Even when the thing that they selected wasn't a perfect representation of what they needed help with, it tended to be that other people would choose the same thing for the same problems that they were having. And so it was a great way of retrieving all of the relevant help content that others in some crowdsource context were having. And so we got some research funding to support this work. I decided to raise some funding and won an NSF career grant based on this. This came with five years of funding and PhD support. I had a lot of great faculty mentors who helped me critique and refine the ideas over several drafts of this career grant proposal. And so I had funding from a PhD student and this was really the first chunk of resources that we got for this project. After about a year, Parmeet had a really great prototype that was working. We were working with her co-advisor, Jake Wobrock, and iteratively prototyping and testing this idea. And we really found ultimately that this retrieval technique of pointing to things in the interface was highly effective and required only a selection and no text input to really retrieve relevant knowledge base articles or question and answer content in the top three results quite frequently. And so Parmi, as part of this, had won a Facebook fellowship based on some of this work, and they invited her out to intern for the summer, and she wanted to demonstrate it. And so as part of that demonstration, she was wondering how she would protect her intellectual property. So she reached out with our technology transfer office, which is now called CoMotion, and they said, well, you need an NDA. And she said, well, what's an NDA? We didn't really know so much about how to protect this intellectual property. And so we asked for help from them and they provided some support from that. They gave us an NDA so that she could start those conversations with Facebook. They introduced us to a serial entrepreneur, Ken Meyer, who was helping new founders start companies as part of a new consultancy that he was starting. He saw real potential in this basic technology feature, which is how he saw it, encouraged us to consider founding a startup to sell it as a service. 
Obviously, we had a lot of decisions to make about that. It wasn't clear to us immediately that that would be a good idea. Parmeet was asking, well, do I want to stop my PhD and start a business? Do I trust my advisors to do this without me, right? Jake and I were not necessarily in a position of doing it ourselves. Jake was wondering, do I want to use my sabbatical on this? He had a sabbatical coming up. Will my family support me in doing this? And I was wondering, do I really have the time to moonlight for a year before I go up for tenure? The timing of it was not great. Will my wife and my child be supportive of this too? These were all challenges because I wanted to make sure I had time for them as well. We ultimately decided to do it after a year of deliberations. Parmeet said, I'm going to focus on my academic career. Go on without me and start the business. And Jake said, great, I'll be the chief executive officer, the CEO. And I said, great, I'll be the chief technology officer. We hired that serial entrepreneur that our technology transfer office had connected us with, Ken, as a consultant. And he really started helping us secure customers, talking to businesses. And when we were just those two employees at the time, Jake spent most of his time raising funding and I spent most of my time building out the 1.0 product that we would sell to businesses. The fundraising was pretty successful. We raised half a million dollars from a university related seed fund, a way of bootstrapping a company. We raised another two and a half million dollars from a venture capitalist firm backed by mutual funds, which is how most venture capitalists get their, their resources. And we hired two engineers and one salesperson. And in about a year, we landed 10 paying customers and started building that base. And then after that, started growing even further. And then we made a commitment to all of our employees and to our investors that we would stay onto the business for two years and then return to the university, passing on the reins to some more experienced business executives that would help scale up the business once we'd validated the product. Those two years were a long two years. I worked 50 hours a week at the startup, which was pretty modest. We were really serious about having work-life balance at the company, and that wasn't always easy. But I was also doing some faculty things as well. I was managing grants, advising my PhD students. I wasn't teaching or doing service, but I didn't really want to give up on my lab. And so they were very busy weeks. Simultaneously, my daughter was struggling with a new bipolar diagnosis and other challenges with suicidal ideation. So it was a really challenging couple of years. In that process, my family and supports, my wife and my ex-wife were really the anchors. They helped me emotionally. They helped support the time that we were doing there. And we had to support each other in that process. But by the end of those two years, I was definitely ready to be done. I needed less to do and I needed to be able to focus on my family. So after those two years, when I left, we had 16 employees. We had hired a new CEO and CTO to help grow the business beyond where we were at. And I stayed on in a very part-time basis to help with research and development, with patents, and with some of the strategic decisions where they needed some of our research expertise to make decisions about product. Several years later, the company had grown quite a bit and made some money and had some impact. We sold it to hundreds of companies and millions of people used the services on the website. You'll even see some of those in our competitors' products where they replicated our features. These are the little Q&A bubbles that might appear on the bottom right of a website. But in the end, I made very little money, right? I made about $4,000 in royalties, which was certainly more than the $1,000 I put down initially to found the company and, and build out the first million shares of the company. And I made nothing on the acquisition because ultimately the company had to take on some debt in order to keep surviving and scaling and growing. And when companies do that and venture capitalists have invested, they often get first dibs on any of the acquisition in the sales. And so that just didn't result in anything that would help me financially. So this is just an example of how money doesn't always come about from some of those things. Now, would I do it again? I get to satisfy much of my entrepreneurial itch as a professor. I'm constantly starting new projects. I'm constantly fundraising for new projects. I'm always recruiting new students to work with me on those projects. So to me, being a professor feels entrepreneurial. So it would really take the right project, the right people, the right timing for me to do it again. And even then it would probably be a maybe because it's just really exhausting work. On the other hand, it was super fun working with so many wonderful people on a team, growing a team, getting to define a culture. Those are all things that are really rare opportunities that, yes, faculty can do to some extent, but really the concentrated focus and attention of a startup like that was something that's really hard to replicate anywhere else. And I really enjoyed my experience. So I don't regret it at all. And with that, I will pass it on to Radhika. Hi, I'm Radhika Nakpal. You've heard from Amy, and now I'll tell you a little bit more about other types of entrepreneurship. So just to introduce a little bit about myself, I'm a professor at Harvard. My main area is robotics. I work on hardware and also algorithms for collective behavior. 
And I also work on a lot of diversity things. So you may have met me if you came to previous CRA WP grad cohort events. So Amy talked about starting a startup and being a CEO and, and spending full time at a company. And I've participated in several forms of entrepreneurship, but much more at a lightweight level. And I'll talk about that a bit today. And a little bit about myself. My favorite hobbies are I like to paint and dance. I love to eat. I'm a terrible cook, but my most favorite hobby is to sleep. I love the Caribbean beaches. My husband is from the Caribbean and I have two kids who are 21 years and 18 years old. All right. So what do I mean by lightweight entrepreneurship? So there's several different ways you can participate in entrepreneurship that don't involve making it your entire full-time job. So one of the, the key ways is patents. So for any invention that you have, research that you're doing, before you publish it, you might have a chance to make it into a patent. And for this, you can talk to the Office of Technology Development. Almost every university has one. They'll help you convert your idea into a patent, and then the patent is litigated, so they'll see if it's possible to actually declare a patent on it. So in this case, you want to have a novel idea, you want to have some sense of the business interests, and the university will actually pay usually the patent's costs, and in return, if the patent gets licensed, they get to take a large amount of the IP investment on it. So in my case, I got to participate in a patent for the first time. This is my first foray into entrepreneurship was we developed a soft orthotic for the ankle and also for the knee, but to create soft wearable systems. This is really in the early days of that field. And we filed a patent that was licensed. And this was joint with, there were 18 other inventors. So it was a, it was a fun process to do. Okay, so, so that's a case where there's a patent, somebody licensed it, and that was all my involvement. A different project that I took part is you license it and you have a relationship with the company. So in my lab, one of the things we're known for is creating different kinds of robot swarms. And the Kilobot was a big project in my group to create a, a robot swarm with a thousand robots in it. And in the process, we thought a lot about manufacturing. So how would you manufacture robots at large scale? How would you make them really low cost? And so when we did all of this work, the thought was, well, wouldn't it be great if all of these research labs could also have robot swarms that they're large, 100 to 200 to 1,000 robots easily? And what would that take? So we talked to a company, K-Team, that distributed robots, and they licensed the design for this robot. So it's a little bit different from a patent. And they actually allowed us to have the design open source. So this was also an interesting thing. You could have the design open source, and so people can make it non-commercially, but this commercial entity got to be the exclusive group that made the robots. And now they're dozens of labs worldwide. There's about 8,000 robots out there in different labs. And that's been really exciting. It's been a way for many research groups to use research from our lab without us doing all of the work of maintaining it. And this was far more work than the patent. We have a long-term relationship with K-Team. We did workshops. We developed some software to make it easy to program the robots using a web-based interface. But it really led to really new and interesting kinds of research and a lot of biologists also bought these robots, which I think was a really, really wonderful thing that I had hoped would happen. And then those are, again, two examples where the key idea is you're licensing out your work to a different company, and you may or may not have a longer term relationship with them. And then my third or most involved example of doing entrepreneurship is I co-founded a company in the area of educational robotics It's called Root Robots. And so we make these robots that have magnetic wheels and they can move on whiteboards and they can draw and they can erase and they can sense colors and you can program them to do all kinds of different things. And our group developed different programming languages so that kids from elementary school all the way to high school could learn different kinds of algorithms and different programming languages using a single robot. And our goal was to get this into schools and also for parents to be able to buy them. So this was a really fun project. I had never thought that I would do a startup. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was on my I will never do a startup list. But the goal was so exciting. And my two co-founders, Rafael Cherny, who worked with me as an undergraduate, and Ziv Dabrowski, who actually led some of the entrepreneurship work at Harvard, really convinced me this was the right thing to do. And the timeline is very similar. The process was very similar to what Amy described. 
We started with an incubator within Harvard. So we had some first few years to develop a prototype. We then did a Kickstarter to raise money. Then we did a, a round of angel funding. And I think at that point, it was clear to me that I didn't want to exit with the company and the other two founders did. And so that became how we divided the equity. I had a small bit of equity in the company. The majority went to the two founders who exited with the company. But I spent half a day every week and focused on the part that I liked, which was really thinking about the curriculum and thinking about the learning and thinking about how to make it so that kids of all genders, all backgrounds could make this robot their own and do the kinds of things. So I like drawing so this robot can draw, <laughs> which, is, which was important to me, but I wanted it to be really compatible with whatever a kid's interests were. So for me, this company was a really great way to enter into a world that I had, which is really interfacing with K through 12 education. And I got to do that through this company. And the company was recently acquired by iRobot. So Amy had mentioned, you know, different reasons for doing a startup and financially in how much work you put in isn't actually related to how much financial gain you get, at least not in my case. So if you left to right, I put in increasing amounts of work and left to right, I made increasing amounts of money. So the most amount of money I made was out of the patents and the least amount of money I made was out of the startup. So I think it's important to remember that it isn't always a, a zero sum game. Um, doing entrepreneurship can have lots of side benefits and we did have lots of side benefits. Taking your work into the public sphere, seeing people use it, meeting the people in the policy side who care about the public interpretation of science, who care about education. We had a lot of opportunities that I never imagined that we would have, including having a picture of the kilobots on a bus, which is perhaps the most weird thing that has ever happened to me. All right. And I wanted to end also by just mentioning that there are lots of founders out there, not just the usual founders that you hear about that make lots of money, but the ones who make a lot of impact. And these are three founders that I find really inspirational. The first is a company that many of you might know. Zipcar was one of the first companies to really put forth this idea of sharing. And Robin Chase's mission in co-founding this company was to reduce car usage and to really impact climate change and carbon emissions. And she works full-time on climate change now. And of course, the sharing economy idea was completely new at the time of Zipcar. So I think if there is a founder that you want to think, a famous founder you want to think of, I think Robin Chase for me is one of the most exciting ones out there. And then I, two of my friends have really shown me what entrepreneurship can look like in robotics. So Andrea Tomas, who started a company called Diligent Robots that is building robots, not to replace jobs, but to be assistants to nurses and to improve the quality of life of nurses in the hospitals. And Ayana Howard, whose company is iRobotics, develops robotics and apps and devices to help children with learning disabilities and children with autism to engage and learn more effectively. And for the two of them, they really brought their research and their passion into these companies and have pursued them in different ways. And I just wanted to mention this so you could think of a different kind of entrepreneur as you decide to try your own. All right. I guess we're ready for Q&A.